Thank you for that special music. Good morning, church. It's good to be back in Lebanon, Missouri. I feel like I've been gone a long time. Camp meeting was in there, and, uh, but it's good to be home. Today I want to work through a parable with you. I'm just quick. What do you think is the most well-known parable in society as a whole? Not among church people, but just out there in general. The Good Samaritan is number one. And, and the, the lost son, the, the prodigal son, is number two. So today we're going to look at the Good Samaritan. Jesus taught in parables. In fact, Matthew 13, 34 says that he really only taught in parables. And people differ on how many parables there are. 38 seems to be a pretty decent consensus, but some people still argue whether that's an analogy or a parable or, you know, so whatever. But uh, we're going to look at the one of the Good Samaritan. Now, if you go online, you go to YouTube, you want to look up, maybe you want to watch a sermon about the Good Samaritan. Good luck finding it. What you will find is hundreds and hundreds of examples of strangers being kind to strangers. And it's labeled under Good Samaritan. There are, and everybody know what the Good Samaritan Act is? It's a law. It means if you help someone, you won't get sued if it doesn't work out real well. That's the Good Samaritan Act. And most states, over 38 states, have that in, in, on the books so that if you try to help, you do your best, it won't come back to bite you legally. Now, there are eight states, gone a little further, they have what we call a reverse Samaritan law, and that is if you don't stop and help, you will be criminally prosecuted. Yeah. So uh, there's that. Now, in case some of you haven't read that story of the Good Samaritan lately, we're going to just go through it. Then we'll go back and we'll go through it line by line and we'll see where we fit. Whereas some stories, you kind of try and put yourself in the Bible story, but with parables, you're supposed to. That's the whole idea. It's the parable. Where do I fit in this parable? Uh, last month, we looked at Zacchaeus. He was from Jericho. In this month, we're going to look at, at the Good Samaritan. He's on his way to Jericho. So we're still in Jericho here. And we're going to look at it from Dr. Luke's standpoint. The reason is Dr. Luke is the only one who tells this story in the Gospels. I appreciate Dr. Luke's point of view from a doctor point of view. I appreciate his point of view from a Greek point of view. Even though the Gospel of John is my favorite Gospel, we're going to look at it here in Luke. In Luke chapter 10 is where we'll find this story. Actually, from, from, from chapter 10 onward in Luke, you find many, many, many references that you won't find in the other three Gospels, uh, including the lost son, the lost coin, and the lost sheep. Uh, Luke 10, 25 says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood up and tested him, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? And he said to him, what is written in the law? What is your reading of it? And he answered and said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered rightly. Do this and you will live. But he, the lawyer, wanting to justify himself, said to Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Then Jesus answered and said, and we get into the parable here, a certain man went down from Jerusalem to Jericho and fell among thieves who stripped him of his clothing, wounded him, and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance, a certain priest came down that road and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. Likewise, a Levite, when he arrived at the place, he came and looked and passed by on the other side. But a certain Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was. And when he saw him, he had compassion. So he went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. And he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And on the next day when he departed, he took out two denarii, gave them to the innkeeper, and said to him, Take care of him, and whatever more you spend, 
When I come again, I will repay you. So which of these, these three, do you think was neighbor to him who fell among the thieves? And then he, the lawyer, said, he who showed mercy on him. Then Jesus said to him, go and do likewise. In the story of the Good Samaritan, Christ illustrates the nature of true religion. He shows that it consists not in systems, in creeds, in rites, but in performance of loving deeds. In bringing the greatest good to others. In genuine goodness. We see Christ himself extrapolate that when he quotes Isaiah giving his mission statement, right? It's to seek and to save the lost, yeah, that's, but it's, it's to, to loose the bonds of wickedness, to, to let the prisoners free. It's all these things. And so, this is a great parable. What does it say? It's a little bit literal. The Bible scholars tell us that an event similar to this had actually happened. Not that a priest went by and a... And a and a Levite went by, but, but that a, this had happened. A, a, a foreigner had helped someone uh, that had just been beaten, beaten up and mugged. And, and it had, you know, it was, it was a very common knowing, knowing that it had happened. So Jesus, this, you know, you've, you've seen it on TV, based on a true story. Yeah. Yeah. And then, woo, do they take license after that, don't they? But uh, that's the advantage of that. So what, is it, what does it say? What does it mean? And how do I apply it to my life? Well, let's look at the players involved. Who's the first one that shows up on the scene? The lawyer. The lawyer shows up te- wanting to test Jesus. What kind of lawyer is this? We have real estate lawyers and we have criminal lawyers and we have you know, uh, law lawyers, contract lawyers. This is a religious lawyer. Imagine so many laws... I mean, we would call him a theologian, but because of the com- combination of church and state, you have religious lawyers to determine if you broke the law. There was a time, uh, Edershain Eders- is one of the best Jewish historians we have, and he tells the story of Sabbath lunch. They're gathered around the table, and this guy has his little honey spoon. When he laid it down on the table, it rolled over and touched the centerpiece. And the centerpiece had some wheat woven in this nice wreath thing. And when he pulled his honey spoon back, a couple of grains of wheat came off of the centerpiece and stuck to his honey spoon. And his people sitting right next to him said, "Uh, uh, 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 you have harvested on the Sabbath. And they hauled him in front of the legal lawyers to see if, in fact, they could convict him of this. And the legal lawyer said, no, come on, this is just a little. And from that day forward, if you forgot to get a little wheat on Sabbath, you would take your honey spoon and you could go out and you could smack and you could get your little wheat. But because the law says, right, that's why we have lawyers. So there's a lawyer. Maybe you don't want to identify with him. And then Jesus starts into the story. And... The lawyer it starts this interaction, you know, and you know Jesus could have stopped right here, and when he says, "What must I do to inherit eternal life?" and Jesus could have made the the, the great exposition here of righteousness by faith, couldn't he? That it's not what you do; it's who you know. He doesn't do that. He knows where this guy's at. He's a he's a legalist. To, I mean, to the uttermost. It's his profession. To be a legalist. And he, so he knows he's got to meet him right where he's at. So probably with a little twinkle in his eye. And he says he just throws it right back at him. What's it say in the law? You know, you're the lawyer. What's it say in the law? And this is phenomenal. This guy does not go to the law. He goes to the principle behind the law. This shows us an above average intelligence here. In this legalistic system of which they're stuck. That he actually gets it. That, it's, that the law is to love God first, right? And then the second part, and just as important, is to love your fellow man. 
Where does he get this idea? Well, he gets it from the Old Testament. Deuteronomy 6 talks about put to love God first with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your might. And then Leviticus 19 says you should love your neighbor as yourself. If you're going to tell somebody to love someone, you kind of, well, how much, right? So you give them this standard, as much as you love yourself. Is that a pretty good standard? For most of us, it's, it's as deep as it gets, really, because we're pretty selfish. And if you've got someone that doesn't love themselves, you know, you kind of wonder how that's going to play out. Can you get any higher than that? The answer is yes. Jesus, when he comes along, he raises that standard. In John 13, 34, he says that we, in fact, should love one another as I have loved you. That's a higher standard than loving someone like I love myself. That I should love people the way Jesus loves me is a much higher standard. Jesus is always doing that, answering these questions with a question and then raising the bar, raising the standard. So the lawyer answers Jesus then, probably with a twinkle in his eye, says, hey, you've answered correctly. You know, go do that. And he's not satisfied. There's some discontent. The Holy Spirit has placed some discontent in this man's heart. He knows that the legalist system that he's part of won't cut it. It says, but seeking to justify himself. Wow. You ever been there? Tried to justify yourself? Well, but, but, but the reason I did that, but I really, here's what I meant by that. On and on and on and on. Uh, I, was, I was late, but, you know, just, what's wrong with, I'm sorry I was late. No, we got to give all the reasons why, you know. Well, I didn't do that, but I meant, just, I'm sorry I didn't get that done. Seeking to justify ourselves. It's just human nature. So then he asked that all-important question that leads us into that parable, who is my neighbor? So Jesus tells a story. Departed Jerusalem, headed for Jericho. It's downhill all the way. It's only 17 miles. Any idea what the change of elevation is in that 17 miles? 3,000 feet. If you went from the highest point in Missouri to the lowest point in Missouri, you would have traveled 228 miles and only dropped 1,700 feet. Wow. Anybody know what the highest point in Missouri is? This is extra credit from your geography. <laughs> it's where? 2,000-something. But where? Where is it? Tom what? Tomsock. It's Tomsock. It's the mountain, yeah. And the lowest point of Missouri... This is, water flows downhill, right? You can figure this one out. Where's the lowest point? Now, interestingly enough, my first thought was it would be where the Mississippi River finally leaves Missouri and touches Arkansas. But the St. Francis is lower than the Mississippi, where it leaves Missouri and flows into Arkansas. So this is steep. This is really rough country. This is the country, if you're... If you're David and you're running from King Saul, you can go out, hide out here, and no one will find you. This is also a good country. If you're a thief, you can hide out, and you can run out, you know, bump somebody on the head, take their stuff, and you can disappear into the cracks and crevices and crannies of this 3,000 feet of elevation. So he falls among thieves. Well... We might, want to, we, you know, we might be willing to identify with the guy on a journey, right? But we probably don't want to identify with the thief. I mean, we're all on this journey, right? A Christian, uh, uh, Pilgrim's Progress, right? We're all the good Christian on his journey, headed to the cross to get rid of the burden on his back and all of that. Uh, we could identify with the guy on the journey because we've even been beat up a time or two. But do we want to identify with the thieves? They're part of the story. Well, I don't know. Have you ever stolen somebody's reputation by saying something about them? Have you ever stolen praise that really belonged to someone else? 
I remember one time we were we were going to start a, a an ethnic based group at a church, and I met with them and talked with on and on and on and on and on, and I keep hearing this word uh, dolo, and I didn't speak that, but I'm pretty sure that that meant dollar. And finally, in the middle of the conversation, I said, you can stop worrying about the money. We'll t- the treasurer will take care of the money. And it just went silent in the room. And Radu says to me, they're not going to believe that you don't speak Romanian if you pull stuff like that. And so at the end of that meeting, I told the treasurer, I said, put a, open, I want you to open up an account and put a dollar in there so that, so that it started. And that next Sabbath... I, from up front, I said, we're going you know, to do the Romanian group, and, and there's already been money put in the account. And, and, and I look, and there's these smug looks, people, you know, just, I mean, I know where the money came from that was in the account, but here's everybody acting like, yeah, I did that, yeah. <laughs> A year later, not another dollar had been put into there, and it just fizzled out. So have we ever stolen someone's time? Are you thieves? Have you ever been guilty of cramming five minutes worth of information into 30 minutes? And stealing somebody's time? Anyway, these thieves came out. They took what he had. They took his clothes. And we could probably spin off a whole other parable about being naked, you know, and needing a robe of righteousness and all of that. But, and they left him for dead. Uh, they, they meant to kill him. And then along comes the priest. Who's the priest? That's the easy. You can say that's the pastor, right? I mean, that is easy, right? That's the pastor. It's the pastor's job to be compassionate and help people and, and all of that. It's his job. He gets paid for that. Well, if you're Protestant, you really do believe that every member a minister, the priesthood of all believers, so it's not just the pastor. Then there's the Levite. Who are the Levites? They say, you know, the, the pastor, he always wears his tie up there, but the praise team, they're up there in jeans. It's because they're from the tribe of Levi. <laughs> the Levites, the Levites were the deacons and the elders and you know the, the other people who made up the function of the church. Do we have any of those here? Anybody can identify with that? And then comes the Samaritan. In Jesus' day, there were a million Samaritans. Samaritan, and today there's only about 800. And there's still a distinct group over there uh, in Lebanon and Syria. Uh, This this class of what they came to be called Samaritans happened 700 years ago when the Assyrians overran the 10 northern tribes and, and they killed most everybody that was fighting. But if you weren't fighting, they took the men and dispersed them all over the Syrian nation. No more, you know, not in, not in groups. It split them up was the idea. Then they brought men in from all over other places they had conquered, brought them there, handed out women to them, and said, this is where you're going to live. And... These ladies didn't have a say in this, and, but they still wanted to follow God. So they wanted to worship, uh, but they, now they weren't allowed to. Now they were in a mixed marriage, and they wouldn't be allowed to go to the temple. They wouldn't be, so they, they actually got one priest, and he lived till, till he died. Uh, and then they made their own priests, and by the time, they, then the, the, because of the split, The king from the north didn't want them traveling to Jerusalem because that's in Judah. So he actually started back in Bethel where the sanctuary had been for 400 years. He started church services there again. And then eventually there on Mount Gerizim they built a temple so that they they were mimicking. They believed in the laws of Moses. They believed everything that the Judah did, but they they weren't. They weren't, they weren't considered anything. They weren't allowed to go. Finally, the, Jude- the, the Jews in Judea 
uh, were so obsessed, obsessed with that church on the hill over there that they marched up there and destroyed the Samaritan temple. And uh, they continued, even in John 3, when Jesus is interacting with the Samaritan at the well, she refers to, they still consider that mountain to be an important place to worship. A Samaritan was a half-breed and was despised by both sides. Uh, just rejected, hated, and, and here 700 years has gone by and they won't get over it. And they're still, in Jesus' day, they're despised. It's interesting, at the end of the parable, when Jesus says to the lawyer, who, who, was, it his, who was it that was a neighbor to him? He can't even say the word Samaritan. He just says, the one who did him good. Yeah. He won't even say it, won't let that word even cross their lips. Well, in, in John 3, when Jesus goes to interact with the woman at the well, it's, it's so, oh, I love the wording there. It says he had to go through Samaria. Well, that's because there was a divine appointment there. Because he didn't have to go through Samaria. A really, really, really good Pharisee would go around Samaria rather than, and walk the extra 30 miles rather than go through Samaria. And you can probably think of groups that you know of that have been rejected and despised and considered less than human. And that was the Samaritan. Who does the Samaritan represent? I think in many ways it represents Jesus. Half human, half divine. Rejected by his people. Rejected by a third of his angels. And yet come down here to show compassion on someone that's wounded. Someone that's going to die if they don't get his help. But Jesus is the true good Samaritan. Now we're to be like him. So in many ways we are called to be the good Samaritan as well. So the good Samaritan comes along, he finds this man, and he has compassion. He goes over to him, he, he pours the oil, is really the only salve he's got in his first aid kit. The wine is the only disinfection he's got in his first aid kit. So he uses them. Bandages the guy up. I mean, the guy, remember they took his clothes, right? So if he's going to bandage him, what clothes is he using? His own. His own. Yeah. Maybe he got out of his, his packs on the saddle there. Then what does he do with the guy? He loads him where? Yeah, see, everybody says donkey. Did you know the Bible does not say donkey? Yeah. Yeah. Why, why not a camel? No, we're going to go with donkey. Okay, it just helps the story flow. So we're going to go with donkey. Loads him on the donkey, and then what does he do with him? Takes him to the end. I think there's a lesson there before we move on from that point, though, that if you're going to minister to your people, you're going to have to get off your horse. You're going to have to get out of your car. You're going to have to get out of your house. You're going to have to get out of your church if you're going to really minister to people, especially those people that are hurting. So he goes to the inn. What does the inn represent? I mean, it's our parable. We get to design it. What, do you, what should the end represent? Yeah, the, the church. Isn't that the perfect place to take wounded people to? To take them to the church, right? Where they could receive the help they need and the care and the nurture. And Wow, don't you want to be part of a church like that? Amen. I, I do. And so therefore we are then innkeepers, aren't we? We're the ones, when, when Jesus brings us that wounded soul and says, I want you to take care of him till I come back, right? That's the commission. That's, that is the gospel commission. Take care of him till I come back. Now, if you loaded up somebody and you took them to the hospital, you wouldn't dare say, whatever it costs, I'll pay for it when I get back. 
That could, that could go up in a hurry, couldn't it? But he does that. Jesus does that. Whatever it costs, he will cover it. That's how much he cares for wounded, hurting people. Whatever it costs, he will cover it. He, he brings these wounded people, he hands them to the church, and he says, I need you to be kind to them. I need you to nurture them and feed them and care for them and, and help grow them into nice, healthy people so that when I come back, they're ready. And whatever it takes, he will cover it. So now it's your turn. What role, which of these players do you think would be best to be in this story? If this, in fact, is an analogy of wounded mankind, Jesus coming along and redeeming them, handing them to his church to take care of till he comes, what role do you want to be in that story? Yeah, we, we are all of those things, aren't we? I'm going to suggest, and I don't mean it disparaging in any way, that the best role for you and me is to be the donkey. That we could be the people who haul people, who, need, who wounded people. We are working hand in hand with the Good Samaritan to haul people where they can receive help. And we're quiet about it. We don't say a word in this story. There's no praise. There's just faithful service. Hauling people who need help to where they can get help. Working hand in hand with Jesus Christ. Day in, day out. Up toward Jerusalem or down toward Jericho. doesn't matter. The call is for you and me to be faithful donkeys now you may not like that I mean if you've had a donkey it's a love hate relationship there but uh, but there's the good ones there's the faithful ones not the obnoxious ones there's the good faithful ones that's our call and that's what Jesus says at the end when he, when he, the, he interacts with this lawyer at the end he ends with this and it's a statement to you and to me Go thou and do likewise. That's our call. That we could be faithful servants. We could be faithful donkeys. Working hand in hand with Jesus Christ. To bring wounded people. Where they can receive help. Now you and my role is also to be the innkeeper. To be the. Num to not be this fortress set on a hill. Holding high the doctrines. But to be this hospital. For sinners, Amen. where they can come and receive the help they need, and, and wounded and dejected and neglected as they are, can find a loving, compassionate people who, working hand in hand with Jesus, are trying to heal them to be the healthiest person they can be, so that when He returns, we'll be ready to meet Him. Amen. That's my prayer in Jesus' name. Our closing hymn, we're going to sing 499, What a Friend We Have in Jesus.